Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson, and uh, we have a fascinating guest today, a conservative warrior, an author, the host of the Liz Wheeler Show, and that tells you who it is, doesn't it? <laughs> we have Liz Wheeler, and uh, we're so happy to have you on the show today. Thank you for coming. And uh, before I, I ask you about your new book, I want to read something. This is from the Congressional Record, January the 10th, 1963. It's called The Goals of the Communist Party. Goal number 17, get control of the schools. Use them as transmission belts for socialism and current communist propaganda. Soften the curriculum, get control of teachers' associations, put the party line in textbooks. Goal number 20, infiltrate the press, get control of book review assignments, editorial writing, policy making positions, gain control of key positions in radio, TV, and motion pictures, continue discrediting American culture by degrading all forms of artistic expression. 24, eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling them censorship and a violation of free speech and free press. Break down cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography and obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV. Present homosexuality, de degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal, natural, healthy. Infiltrate the church. Replace revealed religion with social religion. And uh, interestingly, number 40, discredit the family as an institution. Encourage promiscuity and easy divorce. Emphasize the need to raise children away from the negative influence of parents. Attribute prejudices, mental blocks, and retarding of children to suppressive influence of parents. The reason I read that is because there are so many people who think that all of this degeneracy is of recent origin. And uh, that was 1963, 60 years ago. With that backdrop, can you tell me uh, why did you write your new book, Hide Your Children, Exposing the Marxists? behind the attack on America's kids. Yeah, first of all, Dr. Carson, thank you for having me on your show. It's my pleasure. You're one of the most brilliant people in our country. So it's a delight to get to sit here and talk to you. I kind of got the chills when you were reading this from the congressional record, because I think so often conservatives and Republicans assume that everything that comes out of the mouths of Democrats and leftists and the mainstream media are lies because they do lie for diversion very frequently, if not all the time, that we forget that they actually verbalize what they're going to do. They tell us what their plan is. We don't have to do, we don't have to infer what their plans are. They actually do tell us what they intend to do to our country and how they intend to accomplish it. So I, I wrote this book. I started working on this over a year ago because I, like a lot of parents in this country, felt that our children were under a type of assault that seemed like a more concerted effort than ever before. I think a lot of parents looked over their children's shoulders on Zoom school during COVID and said, wow, this critical race theory, poison being poured into my child's mind, this trans ideology combined with, you know, the revisionist history and good old fashioned moral relativism that's been uh, unfortunately prevalent in the public school system for a long time. And I wondered, is this different than it was before or are people's eyes just opened? So I, I set about digging into this to find the answer to this question. And I realized that the answer to this question wasn't so much of, is this a concerted effort, but who is behind this? So what I do in my book is I name the names of both the individuals and the organizations that are behind this assault on America's children that we all know is happening. The book is not an argument to convince people that this is happening. We all know that it is happening. And you're exactly right when you note that this is not new. 
the left has been trying to re-engineer our society for almost a century now. And unfortunately, they've been quite successful at it. They've captured what I call four out of the five major foundational cultural institutions. They've captured the media, they've captured the education system, they've captured a lot of religious institutions, sadly, they've captured the law, and they have set their sights on the nuclear family. I argue in my book that there's one element of the nuclear family that's left standing, and that's children, which probably explains why the left is going after the children. So I name the names of the individuals and the organizations that are propagating these attacks on all of our institutions and through these institutions on our children. And then I propose a solution that Dr. Carson, I will tell you, is different than the solution the Republican Party offers for how we as a movement can take back these institutions and thereby protect and save our children. Well, I am very impressed uh, with what you've done. Where did you get the courage from? You know, most people, they have actually pretty good beliefs, but they stand in the corner and look at their feet and hope nobody calls them a nasty name. That's a good question. And I would say part of it is nature and part of it is nurture. By nature, I'm a pretty confident person. I have been my entire life. Um, I, I was also homeschooled as a child. And while homeschooling is pretty normal now, I think there's maybe 5 million children that are homeschooled in the United States now. At the time that I was homeschooled back in the early 90s, it was not common. It was not necessarily socially accepted. So you know, you learn as a homeschooler in that situation that you really need to analyze people's beliefs about you, maybe the stigma that people hold against you. And you need to learn to analyze yourself based on who you are, your relationship with God, your relationship with family, and not allow peer pressure to determine your self-worth. So my family, I come from a very strong Christian family, a lot of siblings, a wonderful mom and dad who instilled that intentionally in us growing up. So that combined with maybe my natural personality of being pretty outspoken, pretty confident, a little bit stubborn, I think has lent itself to, to being useful in this industry. It, I'm kind of thick skinned by nature too. I mean, the insults, most of them, I think they're pretty funny. A lot of them, I don't really, I don't really read, but it kind of comes with the territory. It is what it is. Well, it's true. I mean, if they're not insulting you and attacking you, you're probably not doing anything. Yeah. And a long time ago, too, I, I remember talking to a group of interns at, at my old job where I worked a couple of years ago, and they asked the same thing. How do you handle the hate? And I was like, well, listen, you can be very clinical about this. You can read an insult that someone sends to you and you can ask yourself, is this insult true? Am I homophobic? Am I a bigot? Am I hateful? Am I whatever other insult of the day they're calling you? And if you can honestly answer that question and say, no, I don't hate anybody. I'm not hateful. I'm not bigoted. Then you shouldn't care what those people say because they're wrong. Well, you know, I was uh, told that I was a white supremacist. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I said, am I really? How exactly is that supposed uh, just, to work? Just because you, you speak the truth. And, uh, you know, it, it's fascinating to me how the left in particular uh, designs a box that you're supposed to fit in. And if you don't fit in that box, then you are a target yeah. for everything. And uh, when it comes to tolerance, there's absolutely no tolerance for anybody who deviates. And, uh, you know, probably the most racist thing I ever heard was when President Biden said, if you're having trouble deciding between me and Donald Trump, you ain't black. Mm. <laughs> Give me a break. These people are absolutely absurd. But uh, you state that the fight is just beginning uh, in your book. Uh, we're talking about CRT, DEI, some of the academic institutions, what the Marxists are doing. What do you foresee? Well, let, let me add to that comment. When, when someone called you a white supremacist, what's really interesting is on its face, this seems almost laughable to us, right? How can a black man be a white supremacist? They're telling you you're self-loathing because you're not acting in this box that they've created for you. Just like they tell me I'm 
have internalized misogyny because I'm pro-life and I'm a woman, right? Like on its face, it seems absurd, but the deeper you dig into the ideology, which is what I do in this book, you realize that these phrases that they're using, whether it's misogyny when it comes to women who are Republican, whether it's racism, white supremacy, when it comes to black people who are Republican, they're actually not talking about skin color. They're not, that when they, when they, say the word racism, they're not talking about our characters. They're not talking about how we feel about people of another race or how we treat them or equality under the law. It all actually comes back to an economic system. It comes back to their anti-capitalist beliefs. And one of the questions that I have gotten pretty often about this book is, are you just using the word Marxist as sort of an empty insult and ad hominem? Are you talking about like Karl Marx? Because that's a long time ago. How is that relevant to our society now? And what I explain in the book is, Yes, it's, it is Karl Marx's ideology, his economic Marxism, this idea that the working class should revolt against the ruling class and usher in, a, you know, an anti-capitalist revolution. That obviously didn't work the way that Karl Marx envisioned it. He wanted to spark this global Marxist revolution, and it didn't happen. Marxism kind of went out of style. It, it, it died almost, went dormant, I guess is a better way to put it. But then... In the early 21st century, a man by the name of Antonio Gramsci, he was Italian, he was actually the co-founder of the Italian Communist Party, he recognized while studying Marxism that successful Marxist revolutions didn't start with just the discontent of the working class based on economic conditions, that successful Marxist revolutions started first with the destruction of civil institutions, which is cultural institutions, on which the working class relied. And Gramsci named, among others, he named the media, the education system, religious institutions, the law, and the family. So when we see this concerted effort against these cultural institutions now in our country, it's not some different brand of Marxism compared to the Communist Manifesto and Karl Marx. It is just a, a retooled, revitalized way to apply that same Marxism to our country at the heart of all of these Marxist efforts is still an anti-capitalist goal. They want to topple our free market, which is the foundation of our of our free society. So when they when they label me an internalized misogynist or you a white supremacist, they're just using that to try to gin up the discontent among demographics, maybe based on sex, maybe based on race, that they used to try to gin up against or among the working class to get them to revolt against the ruling class. It's the same thing. It's just applied a little differently. Well, they're all about uh, manipulation too, yes. manipulating people. Um, you know, Lenin uh, famously said, although they try to deny it, they denied it, he said it, uh, that they used people and named them useful idiots because they don't even realize that they're destroying themselves. They're destroying their own prosperity and that of their children because they get pulled into this ideology and they don't think they just repeat what they've heard. And what I've found is when you begin to ask them questions, uh, it doesn't take long before they start calling you names because they don't have an explanation for what they believe because it doesn't make any sense. But uh, how do you foresee all of this ending? Well, I write in my book that we're at the moment of truth. The Marxists realize because of the successful efforts of many parents and conservatives, and it's not just conservatives, concerned citizens who didn't want their children indoctrinated with critical race theory or trans ideology. And there's been a movement in our country very successfully in the past two years to push back against these topics being taught in the classroom or schools being used as indoctrination centers. And those on the other side, the Marxists that want that to be the rule, recognize that their time to impose Marxism is either now or never, because we finally, finally, as a country, are able to label them. We are able to identify, accurately identify the political enemy that we face. The Republican Party has made a very big mistake in the last 50 years in assuming that the other side, Democrats and leftists, are just well-intentioned, good faith opponents who propose unwise or impractical solutions, but share the bedrock values that we as Republicans and conservatives hold dear. And that's not the case. So Democrats and Republicans 
used to have the same goals. They just had different ways of getting there. Now they don't have the same goals anymore. It, you're exactly correct. I mean, and it's probably that probably started to be a significant divergence in the 1960s when some of these radical Marxists took over our education system, started taking over positions of power within the Democratic Party. But we don't share the same bedrock values. I mean, we love America. They actually think America is a bad and evil place. Um, so for the first time, especially since COVID, a lot of Republicans and conservatives, our eyes have been opened and we're able to see our opposition for what they really are which allows us to calibrate the way that we fight back in a more effective way. So what's going to happen next? We had critical race theory. We had the transgender ideology. What's coming next is the left's going to use um, the quote unquote body positivity movement to do the same thing. They're going to try to tell people, <laughs> obese people, fat people in our country, that they are a marginalized demographic and that the only solution to that is to overthrow capitalism so that their fat bodies aren't commodified. And then we're going to see a continued and much more severe assault on parental rights, because the one element of the nuclear family that I mentioned is standing is children and the Marxists must sever the bond and the legal connection. So the, the spiritual and physical bond and the legal connection between parents and their children in order for this to be effective. So those are the two things that I'm watching for and you can see it happen once you realize that they'll tell you the left tells you what they're going to do that's the fight that we're going to see next and i'll tell you it does my heart good to see young people uh who think the right way because it makes me believe that maybe there is hope for us after all and uh, as i travel around the country i'm finding more and more young people who are actually starting to think for themselves. And it still fascinates me why they aren't upset about the fact that we're spending all their money and going to leave them with tremendous debts that's going to have a real impact on the quality of their lives. Maybe they just haven't come to realize that yet. What? Why do you think they don't worry about such things? You know, I'm part of the millennial generation, so I can speak for my generation. I And this applies, I'm sure, some to Gen Z as well. But we are very fortunate as young Americans to be, we've spent our entire lives in the most prosperous country in the world. We don't have any memory of economic hardship. We don't have any memory of of rationing or depression or any time. We don't have any memory of money being a struggle even the poorest in our country, and I don't mean to sound elitist here, I was raised in a middle-class household, but even low-income Americans are at the highest standard of living that we've ever seen among the poorest classes in our country. We are a very, very fortunate people, and I think the idea of economic hardship just isn't tangible to younger generations. We don't understand what it would mean not to have a bounty of food and not to have a place to stay and for there to be a serious threat to our opportunities or um, anything else, our possessions. We don't, we don't understand that because we've never lived in an era where that was truly threatened. I, in a sense, I hope we never have to experience that because I would never want that for my daughter or any other children. Um, I would never want that for any American, but it is harder to feel the reality or the tangible fear and foreboding of such a threat if you have no if you have no experience having ever touched anything near to that um because i've experienced the same thing as you young people it's it's just when you talk about debt and deficit and spending it's very hypothetical it's not juicy it's not interesting it's not something that touches it's not something they believe touches their lives even as politicians claim oh if we keep spending we're gonna hit catastrophe it never really feels like catastrophe to young people. So I'm not sure that that's the primary issue that we are going to be able to use to reach young people. I think the cultural and social issues that can be more uncomfortable to talk about, but those are the issues that are touching young people are going to be the most effective ways of inviting them and bringing them into either a conservative mindset or hopefully to Republican mm -hmm. voting eventually. <laughs> well, what do you think... Uh the family is such a target for them. Well, ultimately, and I say this from a Christian perspective, I mean, marriage is the sacred union between one man and one woman, and it is God's design to show 
as best he can to human beings on earth, his love for his church. That's why we look at marriage as the husband representing Christ and his bride, the church. He's, he's supposed to be sacrificial. She's supposed to accept his mission to protect her, to help her be holy, to get her to heaven. And as much as we have tried to secular, secularize our society, it can't really be done because this institution isn't a secular institution. People might pretend it is or try to make it into just a contract, just a partnership, but at its core, it's not. And especially once you have children, this is the, this is the gift that God has given a married couple to say, this is how much I love you as much as you love your child. I'm giving you a role in my role as the creator this this family unit is a fundamental threat to marxism because marxism is at its core a satanic belief system it is a demonic belief um that people aren't worthy aren't made in the image and likeness of god aren't worthy of rights um that they have no spiritual dimension to them and that's the antithesis of what the family unit is so in order to really impose an atheist ideology you have to destroy the most obvious form of Christ's evidence on earth. And I know that's a religious, I know that's a religious belief, but that's what I truly believe um, is the case on why Marxists attack the family. Nothing wrong with religious beliefs. Our, our country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Our founding document tells us that our rights come from God. And there's nothing in the constitution that mentions separation of church and state. So, uh, not a problem, but because you just articulated that so well, I feel safe in asking you this next question. <laughs> what about feminism? That is a spicy question and I love it. I think feminism has been incredibly destructive. And the reason that I say that is because I do not define feminism as simply equal rights under the law for women or equal dignity in the eyes of God between men and women. That's obvious. All of us support those things. All of us support the right for women to vote and to buy property. And we all, I hope, view men and women as being of equal dignity. But that is not what feminism is. There's a common misconception even among conservatives that quote unquote original feminism was just about those two things, just fighting for equal rights under the law. Because there was a time in this country when women did not have equal rights under the law. That wasn't a good thing. It's it's a good thing that we've evolved and changed and restored that, um, that quality under the law for women. But original feminism was never about that. Original feminism always held at its core a very derogatory, very demeaning view of women as mothers and women as wives, women, God forbid, as a stay-at-home mom, housewife, homemaker. They always believed that that was the inferior choice for women to make. It wasn't just a matter of, oh, we want to empower women by giving them the choice, by allowing them to work if they want to, or allowing them to stay home. That's not what feminism ever was. Feminism has always been what I would call a neo-Marxist belief that men and women aren't different, except for perhaps what body parts are different, but that men and women are exactly the same. And you and I know that that is not the case. That's not the case physically, mentally, psychologically, or spiritually. And it's not a bad thing that men and women are different. We are intended to complement each other. It's not a competition. And I think the way that feminism has taken a hold in our society, and especially the way that it tells young women now that they shouldn't want, they shouldn't desire to get married, to fall in love, to have families, to raise their children, to take care of their households, but instead should pursue a career that looks exactly like what a man of your age might want. That's been incredibly destructive. It's, it's harmful for women. And it's the reason, it's one of the reasons that um, if, you, if you look at the historical trends of how happy women are or not, women are at their unhappiest point ever in our country. Well, let me ask you the corollary question. Masculinity, toxic masculinity. Why are they after men and masculinity? Well, they certainly are after men. They are trying to demonize masculinity because what easier way to subjugate a civilization than to neuter the men who would be the ones ostensibly fighting back against tyranny. These two things, femininity and masculinity, what are they? They are the core of who we are as men and women. Again, the core of what we, what we, the dynamic that we have in relationships and ultimately marriage. It's all, it's all 
based on the attack on the nuclear family. If you can destroy men and you can destroy women and you can destroy sex the way that they did in the sexual revolution, um, then you can fundamentally destroy the marital bond. You can destroy this, this beginning of the family unit to prevent it from ever happening. So I, re I have an entire chapter in my book breaking down the elements of the nuclear family and how those who are at the core of attacking masculinity, the intersectional feminists, if you will, um, those who brought the feminist narrative to such prevalence in our country, the sexual revolution, the degradation of, of, of social sexual mores in our country, um, they all had in their direct object the destruction of the marital bond, which is an attack on the nuclear family. Absolutely. They don't believe Marxism and the family unit can exist at the same time. And I probably agree with them on that. Well, you know, traditional nuclear families are at an all-time low. We have like 23.1 million of them now. The vast majority of families are no longer traditional nuclear families. And uh, it is a real problem. You look at how rapidly our society is declining. And I don't think any objective person would disagree that we are moving in the wrong direction. And I think most of the recent polls have demonstrated that people think we're moving in the wrong direction as a country and as a society. Um, it's a it's a very, very big problem. But I think uh, your focus on the children is exactly right. Now, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Well, Vladimir Lenin also said, give me your children to teach for four years and the seed that I sow will never be uprooted. What do you think is the point of critical race theory and some of the things that are around it? Why did they introduce that into the realm of our children? Well, critical race theory, and a lot of people know it by name now, but at first they just recognized it as when their children were being told, if you're a white child, you're inherently racist based only on the color of your skin, not based on your behavior, your thoughts, your beliefs. If you're a black child, you're inherently oppressed, no matter how successful you are, no matter, no matter any circumstance, you're inherently oppressed. And parents saw this and recognized it as wrong even before we could put a name to it, even before we realized that that being taught to our children was the principles of critical race theory. Critical race theory itself is the grandchild of critical theory, which is a Marxist ideology. It's a, it's a Marxist theory penned by Max Horkheimer in Germany. Um, he was part of the Frankfurt School. And critical theory's object was to destroy in the minds of the people any idea of objective truth. It posited that there's no such thing as right or wrong, as real or unreal, that anything that we view as knowledge or truth was simply the uh, the prevailing political narrative, whatever political narrative had emerged victorious. And critical race theory is intentionally invoking an identity crisis in our young generation, both in white children and in black children, and intentionally turning them against their parents. Because if you're a white child, for example, and you are told that you are inherently racist based on the color of your skin and that you can't do anything to redeem yourself because your so-called racism is based on your white privilege, you enjoying being in a society that was built on white supremacist institutions, this is the, the fundamental of critical race theory, then you're going to feel like a bad person. And the reason that you are a bad person is because your parents made you white because your parents were white. So it creates this animosity between children and parents, which is, as I write in my book, this is the first step in the one-two punch. Once they've created this self-loathing in children, this loathing towards their parents, they swoop in and they offer an antidote. They offer redemption to children. They say, listen, you can throw off this oppressive identity of being white if you choose to put on a so-called marginalized identity, if you choose to be non-binary or queer or gay or trans, then that's a, an identity that you can choose. And those people are inherently marginalized. So once you've rejected your family, who made you white and made you bad, and you've instead chosen to be an LGBTQIA plus identity, you will be marginalized, which means you'll be one of the good guys. They elevate victims, of course. And the result of this is not only fundamentally damaged children, physically, mentally, and spiritually, but it's also a fundamental severance 
of the bond between children and their parents, which again is the ultimate goal of these Marxists. Right. And it can't possibly lead to any place that's good. And I've, I've asked some of them, what good thing is this leading to? And they have a real hard time uh, answering that question. But then you layer it over with the 1619 project and the whole concept of the United States being an inherently evil place because of slavery, uh, which makes absolutely no sense if you know anything about world history, because virtually every society has had to deal with slavery. And uh, we're not unique in that sense. The only thing that's really unique about the United States and slavery is that we had so many people who were vehemently opposed to it that we fought a bloody civil war and lost a large portion of our population to get rid of it. And, uh, you know, that I think is an important lesson for our children. You know, we should look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. But the fact of the matter is, there's a heck of a lot more good than there is bad and ugly uh, when you're looking at the history of this country. What it's not only done for opportunities for people here, but for people around the world. The first super duper power that didn't go around and try to crush everybody else and take their stuff and uh, actually helped other people. Uh, this this is a, a wonderful thing. I think it has a lot to do with our Judeo-Christian foundation. But, uh, you know, we should be proud of these things. We should be willing to talk about them and, uh, and show them to our children because the other side is not going to stop. They're not going to let up. And, uh, you know, they have a very specific goal in mind. And uh, I don't think that there's anything that they won't do in order to accomplish their goals because they believe themselves to be righteous and uh, that those who oppose them are unrighteous. And therefore, anything you say or do to them that's evil doesn't really count. It's sort of the same philosophy that the jihadists have. And uh, it's extraordinarily problematic. Well, you read uh, Gail Rubin's book or essay about thinking sex and uh, trying to understand the agenda that's behind the transgender ideology. What did you, what did you think after you read that? Dr. Carson, I got to tell you, reading Gail Rubin's essay, Thinking Sex, it's the founding document of queer theory. It's one of the most disturbing things that I've ever read. I had to put it down in the middle of it and do a lap around the house. I was reading it late one night because it, it was so deeply disturbing to hear what queer theory espouses. And queer theory, by the way, for anybody, for anybody who might be uninitiated at this point, the transgender ideology that we see in schools where children are taught that gender is a spectrum, that it's not connected in any way to biological sex, that you are what you identify, all of those things, that's the outgrowth of the principles of queer theory, the same way that teaching a white child that they're racist or a black child is oppressed is the principles or the outgrowth of critical race theory. So when we started seeing this transgender nonsense, if you will, in schools, I wanted to see what the foundational document taught. What was, the, what was their goal with this? This isn't just a random assortment of nonsense. And what I found is Gail Rubin's founding document not only teaches these ridiculous anti-scientific things about sex and about gender, she openly defends child pornography and she outright defends pedophiles. She is an advocate for the sexualization of children, which is, uh, I wrote this book over the course of the past year. I've become quite familiar with the material in, in this document. In a sense, you get desensitized to it. The more that you write about it and unpack it and put it together, you can kind of put it in a box and hold it a little further away from yourself. And that first time you read it, it kind of punches you in the gut. And this is the one aspect that I cannot, I cannot distance myself from at all. It is so revolting and so frightening to think that this is the ultimate goal of those who are indoctrinating our children with the transgender ideology. I want to stand on my rooftop and scream to every parent in the country, you have to read this. You have to understand what they're doing. This is not tolerance. It's not inclusion. It's not confusion about your body. They're actively seeking to harm your child in ways that we sometimes we can't even fathom how disturbing these ways are. That is what they're teaching to our children right now. And I try to lay it out in my book in a way that parents are able to read so that it's not 
quite as deeply disturbing. Although I will tell you, it's still pretty, it's still pretty stunning to read it, but just so parents are aware of what this is so that we can fight back against it fiercely and without compromise. Well, so many parents get deceived into believing that the child needs to express themselves and uh, that if you in any way interfere with that, then you're the bad guy. But, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is the brain develops very rapidly after conception. Hundreds of thousands of neurons are being added every single day. And the brain continues to develop right until your mid to late 20s. So your brain is not fully mature until that time, which is the reason that God gave us parents. We need somebody to protect you if you're not, uh, you know, fully developed. And uh, these people are taking tremendous advantage of that. And then they throw the guilt on the parents so that some of them who are really decent people are, e are easily deceived. And uh, I am so delighted to see parents getting involved. The number of homeschools has doubled since 2020. Uh, the, the waiting lines to get into faith-based private schools is unbelievable. And uh, which tells you that the people are realizing what's going on. And uh, so, so there is hope for us. But what would be your advice to someone who says they begin to throw their hands up? They say, what can I as an individual parent or just uh, an individual concerned citizen do as our society continues to crumble before us? Well, the last chapter in my book is a 12 step plan for what we can do to take back our country and our institutions and protect our children from these these mad Marxists. One of the biggest parts of the second half of my book is my critique. And it's a pretty harsh critique of the Republican Party because the Republican Party has failed in the past 50, 60, maybe even a little bit longer than that years in fighting back against these um, these infiltrators. And one of the reasons that they failed is because you and I sit here and we think of the United States of America as a free society. But when the Republican Party thinks of America as a free society, what do they mean by that? How do they define freedom? How do they define liberty? What What is that? And there's really two schools of thought on what liberty actually is. Liberty can either be the end into itself or unto itself, or liberty can be the means to something greater. And the Republican Party in the last half of century has chosen the definition that says that freedom or liberty is the ultimate goal. And the result of that, of course, is you know what David French said when he said that drag queen story hour is just a blessing of liberty. That would have to be true if freedom is the goal into itself. But you and I sitting here, everybody watching this show knows that there's nothing inherently moral about grown men dressed as sexualized versions of women gyrating in front of children. It's grotesque. It's wrong. It's evil. So the definition of liberty must not be an end to itself. It must be the means to something greater. And we as a Republican Party and conservative movement have neglected for decades now to ask the question, well, what is that something greater? What, what, is, what is it a means to? What are we working towards? What does human flourishing actually look like? What do we want our society to be? And when I say Republicans have failed to do this in the last 50 years, our founding documents, our, the Constitution of the United States, was not built on the idea that freedom was the end goal. It was built on the idea that freedom was the means to something greater. And that something greater, as defined by James Madison, the father of the Constitution, in Federalist Paper 51, he defines the, 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 the ends of freedom as justice. He said justice is the end. So, of course, then we have to ask, well, what is justice? How do you define justice? And Edmund Burke, on whom the Constitution was based, his work is, is what inspired the Constitution, he defined justice as the earthly form of original justice, capital O, capital J, original justice, meaning natural law, meaning God's original justice, this innate sense that we all have of what is right and what is wrong and what is moral and immoral and what is good and what is bad. 
And our, our society, our, our founding documents were based on this acknowledgement that no, you don't have to go to church. No one's going to force you to. We're not a theocracy. We want religious freedom. But that being said, the laws of our society and our very social fabric is built on the acknowledgement that there are pre-existing definitions to words like man and woman and marriage and liberty and justice. And those definitions come from Judeo-Christian tradition, meaning they come from God. The Republican Party has abandoned this view, which is the view of our Constitution, and embraced the more libertarian view, which, listen, when I was younger, I probably leaned more libertarian. I wish I could be libertarian now. It sounds great, but it just doesn't work. It leads to the societal chaos that we're having right now, because ultimately one political narrative, if you will, to use the words of the left, is going to prevail. There's no such thing as neutrality. Our society is either going to be governed by the principles of the left or it's going to be the principles of the right. And when the right falls for this idea that we should remove all semblance of morality from our society and from our laws, it allows the left to swoop in and instead codify their version of morality. And that's exactly what we're living now. So what I talk about, what I challenge conservatives to do in, in my book is really grapple with this question. What is liberty and how are we supposed to apply this through the government and through our society to enable human flourishing? And once you allow yourself to explore this, um, you'll realize the Republican Party has gotten it wrong and that we need to adjust our course if we want to defeat this political enemy we face. I think you're spot on there. Liberty was the key that our founders were striving for when they put together this country. And uh, they studied every single government that had ever existed. And it became very clear to them after a while that they all end up the same way. They grow, they infiltrate, and they dominate. It's the natural course. And they wanted to prevent, provide us with a constitution that would keep that from happening. And that's why Benjamin Franklin, when he was asked, what do we have here, sir, a monarchy or a republic? He said, a republic, if you can keep it. And with uh, amazing people like yourself, we will keep it. It's going to be a fight. There's no question about it. But, uh, you know, we've been through some pretty horrible things as a nation before. And... Uh, I have confidence that the American people will recognize that the government's not going to fix itself. And uh, they're going to have to really play a much bigger part, which means, you know, when you go to vote, you don't just look for the name that looks familiar. You need to know who those people are and what they advocate and do they really represent you. Uh, that's the way our system was created so that the people could correct the problem when it occurred because they knew that it would occur eventually. But uh, in closing, uh, you have some words of wisdom, including those words of wisdom when your book is coming out and where we can get it. Those are the most important ones, right? The book comes out <laughs> on September 26th that you can go to hideyourchildrenbook.com to get your copy, or you can pick it up on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, wherever you get your books. It's called Hide Your Children, Exposing the Marxists Behind the Attack on America's Kids. And I do, have, I do have one final thought, and this is a readjustment of the mindset of a lot of conservatives and Republicans. But when you talk about individuals, how we are supposed to correct our government when our government errs, there's been a mistaken idea among conservatives that limited government automatically means as small of a government as possible. When That's not what it means. Limited government means limited by enumerated powers and accountable to the people. And conservatives have forgotten that there is a just authority of government and that we should use the just authority of government to help order our society towards an ordered liberty. And if we don't, I fear we may not be able to defeat this enemy that seeks to overthrow us. But if we do, these opportunities to use state and local and yes, even the federal government to um, to order our society towards human flourishing is possible. But we do have to allow ourselves as conservatives to realize that government isn't in and of itself, automatically immoral or the use of government, that it's okay to use it when it is properly ordered. Amen. <laughs> you need to go on the preaching circuit. You know, uh, <laughs> Alex, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, after his in-depth study of the United States, 
said the thing that inspired him most were the sermons that came out of the pulpits that encouraged ragtag militiamen to beat the most powerful military force on earth and gave the people a sense of morality. And that's what we're lacking right now. But uh, I, I commend you for what you're doing and for your courage. Uh, may God bless your endeavors. We really appreciate them. Thank you so much, Dr. Carson. That means the world to me. And thank you everyone for listening and for buying my book. I'm excited to see what everyone thinks of it. You can go to hideyourchildrenbook.com and get your copy now. All right. And we will be right back with my closing comment in one minute. And we're back. I hope you enjoyed that fascinating uh, conversation with uh, Liz Wheeler, dynamic and courageous young woman. And uh, do make sure you get a copy of her book when it comes out. You know, that discussion really points out the incredible importance of the family and of uh, parental guidance. You know, we live in a society now where children are exposed to all kinds of things, and they're not equipped to deal with all of those things. And they so much need the parents to help them, to guide them through uh, the things that we're doing. Make sure you have conversations with your children about what you believe and why you believe it. You know, passing down those values is an active process. It doesn't occur passively. And, uh, you know, there are lots of different ways to do it. Uh, when, when my kids were little, instead of saying, you can't look at TV, you can't look at this, you can't look at that, I would say, you can look at it, but we're going to watch it together and discuss it. And it gave me an opportunity to, to help them to understand some of the forces that are in our society and how they manifest themselves and the things that they were going to be facing, particularly when they went off to college. And I think it made a huge difference. But there are lots of different ways to do it, but just concentrate on passing those values down because if we don't pass our values down, others will pass values and they won't be the ones that we're happy with. Well, that's this week's show. Uh, make sure you subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you don't miss any episodes. Rate us, review us, tell your friends about us, because we need to make common sense common once again. And remember the four cornerstones, faith, liberty, community, and life. See you next week. 